-hmm. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is <clears throat> operation and maintenance plan. We'll dip a little bit into emergency plans as well, and then the record risk, uh, record retention requirements. Um, this was put together by Angel Garcia. He's one of our seniors. He's actually out of Fresno. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today to present it, so I'm getting my stone on space. Um, we always like to take pictures of, of uh, interesting facilities. So this is one. This is not within a mobile home park, but um, you can see. Uh, so our inlet is here and our outlet is here, branching to two different ones. The pipes are not terribly well maintained. It needs some some uh, uh, some TLC, um, but also oh, you can't really see it on this picture. He took a picture. This this has no uh, inlet valve, so there's no way to control the gas coming in if you need to repair any of those pipes or that meter. And in a lot of systems, you're not really sure where the next point of control is. So. Whenever you're looking at your, your meters, make sure you can see the valve and that it's accessible. Um, especially in mobile home parks, people like to build things around. They don't like the look of their, their meters. They like to build things around them or lean things up against them. And, and uh, those valves can get lost, but it's a really important thing to have available. This one's just bad. <laughs> you can see the, the atmosphere corrosion how bad it is. You also notice that the glass is on this side. So the meter reader has to go on the other side of the fence and look between this is a pedestal for another house. Look between the pedestal and that to get the meter read. Um, they probably should have used a left hand meter on that. It, so this is two sides of the same meter. This is inside a home, inside a cabinet. Not really properly vented, and then they did some drywall work around the back. The drywall work is actually uh, pretty impressive, honestly. But uh, <laughs> but you can also see here how far away that that gas facility is from a, a possible point of ignition. So, you know, an outlet can spark when you plug in or you take out any prong. Um, Having a, a meter inside of a cabinet is not is not against the rules, but there's specific things you have to follow to make sure it can be done safely. There are meters inside houses. Uh, San Francisco has a lot of meters inside garages, and every once in a while we'll find meters inside of utility cabinets. In the um, uh, there's a propane system up in Fort Bragg. That's a, a, an apartment complex that has a meter bank inside of a cabinet in the apartment complex. And as long as it's vented well outside, as long as it's vented well and the regulator is either outside or vented directly outside, it's allowed. And they did it right, but obviously these people didn't. The part L on uh, your yellow book is the, it goes over operations. Um, and that's what we'll cover our O&M, what we call operation and maintenance and emergency plans. And it's all in 192 Um Oops, wrong button, sorry. Okay. Um, so part A of that just says that no operator can um, operate a pipeline without having plans in place, operations and maintenance plans. And then it's also what gives the um, uh, sorry, the authority to the relevant state uh, agency and, and says that operators also have to follow state law. Um, this side is this side is X'd out because it's it's more applicable to large operators. But you need procedures anytime your pipeline is operated, and that's if something gets replaced, if something gets changed, something gets extended, something gets located, something gets inspected. Um, so uh, anything you do on the pipeline, most anything you do on the pipeline, you need to have a procedure for. And some of the things that you need procedures for are making really silly. Uh, uh, I've had people laugh at me saying, 
when I tell them you need a procedure for patrolling, and they say, I need a procedure to walk around and look at stuff. But yes, you need a procedure to walk around and look at stuff. Because if you walk around and look at stuff wrong, you can affect your pipeline negatively. So you need to know what you're looking for. You need to know how to look. You need to know what to look at. And you need to know what it looks like and what is wrong with it if you're going to be patrolling. And patrolling is essentially fancy name for walking around and looking at stuff. But again, if you do it wrong, um, you can you can really mess up your pipeline. Your procedures, your written procedures, should be as specific as possible. Um, earlier this week, uh, Letty used a really good analogy of a cake. Um, uh, if you've ever baked a cake or made anything, you want specific recipe instructions on how to make that cake, or the end product is not going to be very good. You know, an instruction for a cake is not put some flour in, put some sugar in, shake the bowl, put enough water in so it's wet. You know. It, it sits you down, it lets you know the steps you need to go through, how you need to do it, who needs to do it. And on your procedures, they need to be as specific as possible. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Um, they don't need to be hyper, hyper specific on the who. You know, you don't need to say Sarah's going to do this, but you can say hey, the manager is going to do this or a qualified inspector is going to do this. And clarity. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the wrong button. Clarity. Um, if you need outside material for some of your procedures, make sure to reference those. On the propane side, there's some things you may need to reference NFPA for. Um, if you have specific, if you have specific vaporizers that you have manuals for, and the manual helps lay out the the maintenance on those, you can absolutely reference the manuals. Um, on the small operator side, if you say, you know, we're going to adopt this company's OQ program, reference that OQ program, include that OQ program. Anything to make those uh, procedures as specific and clear as possible. Because the idea with the procedures is that you should be able to hand off these procedures to anybody who's qualified. They should be able to follow them and get the same result every time that you do, right? Um, you, you don't get to hand them off to anybody. That person should be qualified to know what they're doing. But if the procedures are not followed or if during the following procedure, people are doing other things or they don't understand them, those, those are not good procedures. <clears throat> so the plans may need to be an outline for compliance. They should either say what you do, um, you know, every month, Jason, every month a manager goes out, controls the pipeline, and looks for atmosphere corrosion, incursions upon the pipeline, looks for, um, you know, that the, uh, the valves are, are safe and accessible, make sure no bleeding things against the meters, right? That tells you what, what to do. Or um, they need to, they need to uh, command what you do. A person will go do this, and you need to do what they say. Either way, you'll be in compliance. Um, and again, he, Angel just wants you to know that the right combination of specificity and detail is needed to achieve those goals. Um, sometimes an operator will hand us a document that uh, it says something nice, but it's really a philosophical document, right? It says, we're a basic, very safe company. We're worried about safety. We do everything we can to make sure we're a safe company. And that's a fine thing to put in writing, but that's a philosophical document. It's not a recipe. It's not a list. It doesn't tell you what to do. It just tells you who they are, what they believe in. And there's a big difference between a philosophical document and a procedural document. Um, I also want to make it clear that copying the code book is not a procedure as well. Every once in a while, we get small operators who say, oh, yeah, here are my procedures. And it is a word-for-word -word copy of the code book. The code book is a results-based um, document. The code book says what should be the results of your maintenance. It doesn't tell you how to do the maintenance. There's some things that outline the, uh, the uh, frequency of the maintenance, right? You can't patrol less than two times a year. You can't give out a PAM less than one time a year. But it doesn't tell you 
how to patrol. It doesn't tell you who can patrol. It doesn't tell you who can send out the PAM. It doesn't tell you what your PAM must look like. Um, it tells you you need to get to the top of the mountain, and it doesn't tell you which route you can take. There's a lot of ways to get up a mountain, right? And the code book is specifically vague on things because they understand there's a lot of solutions to the same problem. Different companies take different ways to do that. So again, do not parrot or mimic a code book and expect an inspector to, to take that as a procedure. It is not a procedure. Um, one thing we're big on is uh, we like to see active voice versus passive voice. And this is, <clears throat> the difference in this is a passive voice says what is done to the pipeline. And an active voice gives the responsibility to somebody to do something to the pipeline, right? Um, the incident needs to be reported to the gas controller or the pipeline must be inspected, blah, blah, blah. Those are passive things. Those are something is going to happen. But it doesn't tell you, it's not specific on who should be doing that and how they should be doing that. Active voice gives responsibility to somebody. So the second one, the supervisor or first employee on the scene will report the incident. This is telling you who is doing it, what is happening, and very specific, within 15 minutes of arriving, um, by telephone or radio, how they're doing it. And so it gives a responsibility to somebody, and that's really important in a procedure. There should be a responsible party to that procedure. To just say it will get done, you know, um, uh, it's like uh, there's a sink full of dishes, right? You don't say the dishes need to be done and leave the house. You tell your husband to do the dishes. You say, you, you're responsible for doing the dishes. You don't say, oh, the dishes need to be done, I'm going. Or at least my wife doesn't do the dishes. So anyway. But, but make sure when you're, when you're looking at writing a new procedure or, or revising a procedure, there is a responsible party. There's somebody who is responsible for making it happen. <clears throat> um, this is a big thing, and, and this is actually a really common violation we see with small operators. Um, that the manual, your operation maintenance and emergency manuals, they need to be reviewed and updated each calendar year not to exceed 15 months. So every year, somebody, usually the manager of the park, should be reading through that document and making sure it still applies to their pipeline, right? The reason it might not apply anymore is um, if the manager has changed, maybe the, your, your emergency list doesn't have the correct thing. Um, maybe you've decided that you need to control bar off so you can you can move forward and say, you know, the book says we only need to control twice a year. Every time you go out, we find a lot of things wrong. It would be better if we control quarterly. That way we can talk to more people and let them know quicker, like, hey, who knows how long the the ladder is leaning up against the pipe? I'd like to get to know that sooner. And you have to make records of this. You have to say, this person reviewed the plan, and these are the changes that were made. If no changes were made, that's fine too. Some of these plans, you said, you know, your plan was from 2010. Some things don't need to change, but if they do, you need to you need to write down what the change was and maybe why it was changed. Um, another thing is that <clears throat> the O&M, any procedure must be prepared, be prepared before pipeline operation. And that goes for components as well. If you're replacing regulators, if you've decided we're not gonna go with this type of regulator anymore, we're gonna go with a different type, um, you don't get to put that type on your system until you have a procedure on how to install it and how to maintain it. You don't get to learn on the fly with new equipment. Um, and like I said, even if it's incorporating the maintenance from the manual, that's fine. The maintenance from the manual is great, but your procedure should say who can do it, when they have to do it, what documentations are needed to show that they have done it. And then this is a big one, must be available to operation and maintenance personnel. Anybody who touches your pipeline should, should have that book available to them. And in a mobile home park, that's usually pretty easy. Maybe there's one or two people who do that. Um, I know some parks that are, that are owned by big corporations, they maybe have a floater 
maintenance guy who goes around, the maintenance person who goes around, and he should know, he should be able to know where the O&M books are for every part he deals with, they deal with. Um, and sometimes that gets muddy, but with a, but with a multi-person company, a propane company, at your, at your mechanic level, at your technician level, everybody should have access to those procedures if they need them. And there's a question with the, the large operators that, um, you know, we've gone back and forth with them of how it needs to be um, presented or how it needs to be available. And um, some operators are going all digital, and so it's available on their phone, which is fine in an area where you can get good cell phone reception, but maybe not in the mountains and maybe not past a certain point. Um, but also, if there's things within your manual um, that you need a lot of clarity on visually, maps, diagrams, things like that, that you need to see at a certain size, shrinking them down to the size of the phone screen is maybe not the best idea. So when you're going all digital, or if you're deciding to go digital, that's, that's one thing to think about. How much of this do we need to see? You can read on the screen fine, but if you need a diagram and it needs to be larger, um, maybe you need either bigger screens or keep it paper. Um, when CPUC comes in and inspects, the first thing we're gonna look at is your O&M system or your O&M manuals, and we're gonna look at certain documentation. So we do look at the revision history. So we look at who reviewed it, what changes were made, maybe why those changes were made. Um, uh, management of do change documentation, um, that's, that's more for large companies that change hands or change um, uh, ownership. Although, you know, there's a huge turnover in mobile home parks on ownership and uh, management. And I would love to see more managers have a management of change where, they're, where they hand off that, that O&M book and, and let people know. Um, I think I would tell you probably 30 to 40% of our inspections are with a manager who hasn't been there a year yet. And so we do a lot of training and a lot of consulting really with new managers. Sometimes you walk in and people don't have the book. They don't know where the book is. We look for procedural availability. Again, can, do people know where the book is? Can they give it to us when they ask for it? Um, if we come in and a new manager says, I don't know, you know, um, we give you a list about a month before we come for an inspection of all the things you need to get ready and they go, I don't know where any of that stuff is. You know, that's, that's a huge red flag. And, and we've gone through people's, <laughs> you know, we go through their office with them to try and find it because there's no reason to hold the manager away. It's not sentimental. It's not. It's not valuable to anybody except the pipeline operator. Um, and again, yeah, the emergency manual availability, um, especially in operations where um, more on the large operator side, if there's a compressor station or something very specific, we'd like to see emergency manuals with certain stations. With small operators, so sometimes you keep everything in a single book. Um, and it would be nice to see if your emergency manual would have been with a technician at the top, sticking out so that in an emergency, you can just flip to the back of the manual. Or flip to the emergency manual immediately. <clears throat> Somebody who's working through an emergency on your pipeline, in theory, should not need the manual because they know what the manual says. It should not be the first time they're reading it, definitely, but. In an emergency, people tend to forget things, so it's nice to have the manual. And I know in some small operators, uh, there's an emergency checklist to just remind them of the things they need to do. They know how to do all those things. They don't need to look up how to do them. But to remember what to do in the order they need to be done is a very, very uh, good tool during an emergency when maybe people get flustered in emergencies, right? Um, so we're going to talk about the, the, the specific procedures they should include, if applicable. Um, and you'll see some red X's in the, in the slides coming up. I've kind of taken out things that are applicable to transmission operators. And I don't think there's any propane transmission within California. 
So procedures must include uh, operating, maintaining, and repairing the pipeline. So those are going to be your leak survey and leak repairs, uh, atmosphere corrosion repairs, things like that. Controlling corrosion. Um, if your pipeline was put in after 1972, it needs a corrosion control. You need to know how to monitor that corrosion control. If it wasn't, you know, there's a grandfather clause that, that you don't need to. But again, we talked about this earlier. If you find corrosion on your pipeline that was put in before 1972, you need to add a, a cathodic protection system. Um, there needs to be a procedure about making construction records, maps, and operating history available to personnel. Um, this is the big thing. Not a small operator so much, but, but on the propane system where you have large system, um, all of your guys who need it should have that available, especially the maps after a key thing that, that sometimes hard to find on large operators. Um, mm -hmm. Gathering data and reporting incidents from Part 191. You should have a procedure on if there's an incident in your park, what constitutes an incident, who you should call, and how you gather the data that you need to be relayed to CPUC and DOT. Um, CPUC puts out a guidance document for mobile home parks and propane operators, um, two different guidance documents. This is one of the pages that um, one of the only pages I suggest that you could probably cut and paste into your procedure. It has, it has the correct um, uh, definition of an incident, it has the correct people to call, it tells you what you need to call, so it is actually a procedural document from our guidance. The rest of the guidance is just guidance, it'll help you, but it couldn't be put directly into your O&M. Um, and when we come in, we're going to be looking for supporting documents showing that you're following those procedures. Um, maintenance documents, how are you fixing your leaks? Work orders are a good document, but they're not a complete document unless it's coupled with a repair. Uh, corrosion readings, obviously, the corrosion inspections. Um, even systems that don't have to be, you should be out there looking at are the pipes rusting above ground? Are we seeing atmospheric corrosion? That can be coupled with your patrolling, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and your patrolling can be coupled with your meter reading if you're doing actual patrolling. Some parks, some systems will claim that, oh, we patrol with our meter reads, but what they're doing is meter reading. And so they don't go to all this, they don't go to every part of their system, right? A patrol is going to every part of your system and looking for things that might be wrong. And a meter read is going to the meters, reading the meters. And so they say, well, we do it with the meter reads, but they don't go to, maybe they don't go to the risers that don't have a meter on them. Maybe they don't go to the master meter. Maybe they don't go to all the above ground pipeline. Um, there are some parts that have a, a good deal of above ground pipeline that does not have meter on it. You know, um, laterals that run along fences and things. Um, leak surveys, we're looking for those, obviously. We're looking for maps. Um, the guidance will, the guidance, I'll, I'll send you guys a link to it. But the guidance will tell you what a complete map looks like and what it should have on it. Um, fault inspections, not really. Applicable uh, incident reports, if you've reported an incident, you should keep that incident report in with your, your maintenance or your emergency claims. Um, I red circled this because this is really the only thing that applies to small operators. As a periodic review of the work and effectiveness of existing procedure, I want to talk about that. So, small operators, maybe during your annual review of the, of the plan, you can sit down with the people who are working on your pipeline, whether that be maintenance or whoever, um, and, and ask them, you know, are you using these procedures? Are there things you're doing that are beyond these procedures? Because what they should be doing in the field when they're, when they're actually working on the pipeline is exactly what the procedures say. And if there's a disconnect, that's a huge problem. It might be that there are practices out in the field that are happening because your technicians and your mechanics know better than the procedure. Or they know something the procedure doesn't. In a company, um, and even in, in small propane companies, sometimes the people who write the procedure are not the people who use the procedure. And if there's not communication between those two parties, 
that this can, can, can cause problems. So there should be some type of procedure within there that talks about how are we gonna talk to the people who actually work on the pipeline and how are we gonna get their feedback on if these procedures are adequate, if these procedures are working, and if these procedures need to be added to, you know? Um, like I said, what your procedures say and what the people are doing in the field should match and they should be safe. If they're doing something out there that's not in the procedures, you either need to stop that and tell them, look, you're not allowed to do that. Or you need to ask them, should we incorporate that into the procedures? You know, maybe it's a better way to do things. Maybe it's an easier way to do things. Maybe it's a safer way to do things, but they're doing it. And that's fine, but it needs to be incorporated into those procedures if that's the case. It is often not the case, though. <laughs> Usually, if somebody's not following procedures, they're not doing it because they want to be safer. They're doing it because they want to be quicker. You know, it's 4.30, something up, something's on TV, something's in the oven. They want to get out of there. See, just real quick, uh, remember what uh, Jason was saying about the recipe. Hey, got four different crews in the field doing it four different ways. You're not going to get the same final result. You want the same result every time. You have to follow the same recipe. That's why it's important to have specificity in the procedure. And as you said, if they're doing something out there that's not in the procedure, they either need to stop doing that, or maybe you can investigate and see if that's something we need to add. Need to add that as an additional step in the procedure. You've got to have that same recipe, or you're not going to have the same final result. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah, and, and, and the procedures, the recipe, are to make a specific result, and that result is, is safe operation of the pipeline. Anything beyond that, or anything outside of that, and you're, you're looking at problems. Um, Procedures must include how to respond promptly to a report of a gas odor inside or near a building. Um, with, a, with a small master meter operator or a small operator, this is usually pretty easy. You know, the PAM tells them who they should call and how they, and, but your procedure should say, how do you respond to that? You know, is there a number that they can call all the time? Gas leaks. Don't wait for the mornings. You know, gas leaks happen all the time. You never know when it's going to happen. So there should be a number that they can call or somebody they can reach at 24 hours a day. And then there should be a procedure on how do we deal with that? Um, do we investigate it? Do we tell them to get out of the house immediately? You know, what information do we give them once they tell us there's a gas leak? Um, so there should be procedures on maybe even a script. If somebody's calling me and telling me they smell gas in their home, what am I going to tell them to do? And it should be a clear communication on that because at that point, you're not dealing with somebody who understands gas operations. You're dealing with somebody who's maybe a little freaked out, maybe a little scared, and trying to walk them through that and, and what they should be doing. And then after you, you communicate things with the, the customer, what are you doing about that gas odor? Um, again, support documentation we're looking for. You're kind of all the same things. <clears throat> Safety related condition reports. Letty talked a little bit about this, uh, about certain things on your pipeline that Simsa doesn't or Simsa still wants to know about. Um, and uh, so I would, I would look through 191 about that, 191.23 on what needs to be reported. I will say some of the things that IMSA considers a safety-related condition, California considers an incident. So um, things like under pressure and over pressure situations are considered an incident in California, even if there's no release of gas. So that's one thing um, you should have, but the point of this is that you should have, um, excuse me, you should have uh, procedures on uh, enabling personnel who find safety-related conditions in the field. How does that 
you get to somebody who reports it. Because in the company, the person who reports it may be in an office. They're not going to be the ones who see the safety related condition. It'll be the people out in the field to see that. What's the procedure for getting that information to somebody to report it? Um, do, 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 do. Procedures required must be included in the manual. Do, do, do. Oh, that's just talking about um, emergency response and accident investigation. So, how do you respond to an emergency? Again, within a Within a master meter operator, that emergency checklist is really nice to have a procedure saying that you should follow the emergency checklist. That's what we're looking for. And then um, accident investigations. If an incident does happen to your pipeline and you have to report it, there should be a procedure on what to do after that and how, how you're going to get to the bottom of the incident and, and how you're going to make sure that incident doesn't happen again. Uh, record retention. We'll talk a little bit about this. So, some records you need to keep for the life of the facility, and some you only need to keep a certain time. So, uh, construction, material repair, MAOP information, which includes uh, freight tests and pressure tests. And most corrosion records you should keep for the life of the pipeline. If you add any material, if you change any material, um, if you're building a new system, we want to see those for the usable life of the pipeline. Beyond the life of the pipeline, if you decide to abandon a pipeline and put in a new one, you should still show the abandoned pipeline on your map. It's important to know where the, the abandoned lines are as well. Because during a dig, if there's two pipelines running parallel, one's live and one isn't, you need to know which one's which. Um, other records, most other maintenance records, um, inspections, uh, uh, leak surveys, patrolling, procedural reviews, they only need to be kept for five years for the test. Um, the exception to that, again, you know, I talked about this with, with you, Jason, was if you're using any of those maintenance records, especially typically like leak survey and, and leak data, to justify your DIMP and justify the risks in your DIMP plans, those should be kept for 10 years. Not applicable anymore to master meters uh, for 19 or 2019, I think. Any questions on this section on operation, maintenance, and emergency procedures? What needs to be in your plan? No. Okay. Um, so that's it. Thank you.